Welcome to the Invertible Matrix Theorem, section 2.3. We're going to take all the theorems we've learned so far, and in the case that we have an n by n matrix, we're going to try and put them all together. So let's review all the important stuff that we've, we've learned so far. From section 1.7, if we have an m by n matrix, we're not requiring it to be square, the following are equivalent. ax equals 0 has only the trivial solution if and only if the columns of A are linearly independent. Okay, and that was true if and only if A had a pivot in every row. Sorry, column. <laughs> because you don't want any free variables in AX equals zero, and so that means you have a pivot in every column. Okay, next one from section 1.4, AX equals B is consistent for all B and RM, is equivalent to B is a linear combination of the columns of A, is equivalent to RM is spanned by the columns of A. The calls of A, and that was equivalent to A having a pivot position in every row, so you didn't end up with a row that was all zeros and then B. From section 2.2, .2, A is invertible if and only if its transpose is invertible, and if and only if A is row equivalent to the identity. And then section 1.9, a linear transformation is on to if and only if the columns of A, where A is the matrix for T, span Rm, and T is one to one, if and only if the columns of A are linearly independent. Okay, so all of these, well, the only, the only, set of theorems here that requires a to be square was this one. But if a is square, then we can get some equivalence of pretty much all of these conditions. And that is the invertible matrix theorem. If you have a square matrix and it's invertible, then it's row equivalent to the identity. It's got n pivot rows and n pivot columns. So you just say n pivot positions. Ax equals zero has only the trivial solution. The columns of A are linearly independent. Linear transformations one to one and on two, that's uh, F and I. Um, I added G prime. So G is AX equals B has at least one solution for each B, but it's actually a unique solution. So that's even better than at least one solution. So I'm adding that, that one's not in your book. Um, and then uh, J and K will allow us to say that um, if you have a square matrix and you multiply on one side by the, by another matrix and you get the identity, then that matrix you multiplied by was the inverse. And finally, A transpose is invertible. There's a proof of G implies G prime. And corollary of the IMT was that thing I just referred to that said, if you, you only have to check one side. If either AB is I or BA is I, then B is the inverse of A don't have to do both sides multiplication. Okay, so we're going to look at some problems that, that involve the invertible matrix theorem, and we'll talk about it more as we go through the course, but let's do a review of inverses and transpose and the properties. So if we have A plus B transpose, there is a property for that. That's A transpose plus B transpose for the um, product, we want to go in the reverse order, B transpose, A transpose. Same thing for inverse, B inverse, A inverse. For a scalar multiple inverse, we want 1 over that multiple times A inverse. There's no property for this. A transpose inverse is the same as A inverse transpose. And the formula for a, the inverse of a two by two is one over the determinant 
AD minus BC. And then dancing naked bears never cause accidents. Dancing naked bears never cause accidents. And that's if AD minus BC is not zero. Okay, let's look at some applications. An n by n upper triangular matrix is a matrix where all the entries below the main diagonal are zero. So if you draw a line below the main diagonal, everything below is zero. That's called upper triangular. So when is an upper triangular matrix invertible? By the IMT, you need, in this case, this is a three by three, so we would need three pivots. You need three pivots, but since an upper triangular matrix is an echelon form, the pivots will be the entries on the main diagonal as long as they're non-zero. If you had a zero, that wouldn't be a pivot. So what we need is all main diagonal entries, M-A-I-N, diagonal, all main diagonal, that's two words, it looks like one, entries non-zero. So you can actually just look at an upper triangular matrix and tell if it's invertible. You can't find the inverse that easily, but you can say, oh, it's invertible or not. This one is invertible because all the main diagonal entries are non-zero. You've got three pivots. Same thing for lower triangular, because the transpose of an upper triangular is a lower triangular, so the same condition holds. Okay, determine if the matrices are invertible without any calculations. Okay, we've got a two by two. We're not allowed to do the determinant. So a, we can't do AD minus BC, but we can just look and say, okay, there are two columns. One column is not a multiple of the other. And so the columns are linearly independent. So this is yes because the calls are linearly independent. Because there's only two columns and one is not a multiple of the other. The next one, no brainer, no, not square. Next one, three columns, but you we can see that column two is twice column one. So this is gonna be no calls not linearly independent. And in fact, if you want a dependence relation, if you took negative two column one and added it to column two and then added zero column threes, you'd get zero. So there's your dependence relation. Okay, sometimes they're not so easy. So the next one, use the IMT to determine if this is invertible. Nothing jumps out at us. I don't see if one column is a multiple of the other. I don't see a zero column, that would be good. Um, it's not an echelon form, so I can't look for pivots, but I can put it in echelon form. And so I'm gonna have to do some work here. I'm gonna have to reduce this to echelon form and count pivots. Don't have to go all the way to reduced echelon, just echelon, echelon. Okay, so I'm gonna take, um, I'm gonna leave row one alone, I'm gonna leave row two alone, and I'm gonna take row one, multiply it by negative two, and add it to row three. So that'll give me zero, um, six plus seven is 13, and then three. Okay, and now I'm going to leave row one alone, leave row two alone, and I'm gonna add 13 times row two to row three. So zero, zero, 16. So this is upper triangular. All the main diagonal entries are non-zero. So this is yes, I've got three pivots. Or you could say, yes, it's upper triangular and all the main diagonal entries are non-zero, <laughs> but this is quicker to write. 
Okay, suppose h is 5 by 5, and there's a vector in R5 which is not a linear combination of the columns of h. What can be said about the number of solutions to hx equals 0? Well, if there's a, if there's a vector in R5 that's not a linear combination of the columns of h, that says the columns of h do not span R5. So in the, in the IMT, if one thing is not true, they're all not true. So if H is not true, then D is not true. So AX equals zero has more than just the trivial solution. So if we go back here and figure out what we're trying to say, what can be said about the number of solutions to hx equals zero? So hx equals zero has um, more, well, it has non-trivial solutions. The, the theorem says um, if the columns of h span R5, then hx equals zero has only the trivial solution. So this has non-trivial solutions. But that doesn't answer the question. The question is how many? If it's got non-trivial ones, it's got infinitely many. Infinitely many solutions. And that answers the question. OK. If the columns of H, of the columns of a 7 by 7 matrix D are linearly independent, what can be said about the solutions to DX equal B? Well, this is G and G prime. First of all, there's at least one, so they exist. Second of all, <laughs> there's only one. So they, those solutions exist and they're unique. So what can be said? They exist and are unique. You just put exclamation point there for unique. Okay, so this is a pretty short section. The practice that you're going to do um, involves more than just what we've done. It's a review of, of stuff. So uh, and it, how many problems? Just two? No. So some review problems, stuff, you know, solve AX equals zero and write the solution in parametric vector form and then finding an inverse of a three by three. So it's not too bad. Okay, and that's the end.